so yeah, this is the actual code or the actual project folder. We could be starting with this one, which is pretty easy. This was the uh, script I used to open the correct uh, URL with the correct canister ID and CRC concatenated to it. And yeah, this just um, converts the canister ID from binary to hex. And this one um, calculates the cyclic redundancy check sum for the given ID and then we can concatenate both of these to this um, predefined URL and depending on your operating system we either use open or XTG open. So pretty normal and it saves you the time of um, running these steps over and over again. Uh, but I heard from a recent um, workshop with Definity that um, the process of uh, opening those uh, URLs will be made mm. easier and you can actually also just in the future um, click on the canister ID in your terminal and then it just opens your web browser with the uh, correct ID. So, mm, yeah, let's begin. Hmm, where to begin? Maybe this one. It's pretty straightforward and maybe some a little bit boring. Um, we defined uh, our entry point for the front end, which usually is index.js, uh, but because we use uh, React, um, we renamed this to index.jsx. And this is our main um, main file. Also pretty straightforward. There is only one file in the source folder. It's this one. And yeah, we are on tfx 0.5.7. And this is just uh, um, default default stuff. So let's begin with the code. Um, those things up here are import statements. Um, we import functionality from the standard library. Uh, Definity calls it base, base library. And this one is for debugging. This provides uh, array functionalities. And this one is to iterate. So in this whole file, there is actually only one actor. And this actor is called universe. And I will just go through the code from top to bottom. Inside, uh, inside this actor, I um, declare a variant type, which is called cell. This actually uh, represents my, my cells. And as I said before, when I explained the rules of Game of Life, a cell can either be dead or alive. And this is exactly what it says. Um, a cell can either be of the type dead or alive. And down here, I declare the. Oh, this is a type, of course. It's a type declaration. And down here, I declare the universe type. The universe type uh, consists of these, uh, those three variables, and the width of the universe, the height of the universe, and um, an array that contains cells, which I call cells. So this means array which is made out of cells or the, uh, elements of the type cell. So also pretty straightforward, pretty easy to declare those types and to understand them at least I think. And this is my universe type. So let's head down here. Down here I actually initialize the universe of the type universe. So this is the um, variable name and this is the type. And 
because universe has a type universe it is clear what those variables have to look like they all have to be um, vars and width has to be of the type net the same for height and cells has to be an array of cells or in this case initialized empty and yeah cells functions as a, a flat matrix so in this case we store row after row so the first row and after that the second row and after that the third row and so on and so on until the last element in the um, array is the bottom right element in the matrix and the first element in the um, actually I can show you so this row here goes first after that there's this row and then this row and so on until we hit the bottom so this is our first function declaration um, as you can notice here with the public keyword it's uh, part of our public API and people can call this method from the outside and also this is an asynchronous function so this function populate takes three uh, no takes two arguments one is the width and one is the height the height and we say that our object which we declare above our universe should have the width width i can't pronounce this word width uh, <laughs> uh, assigned to it and the same goes for the height so in the beginning my universe is empty it has zero height and zero width and then with the function called populate i actually populate my universe and make it live and the same goes of course for our um, cells so the, the cells of the universe have to be populated and as you know the or as i already told you the cells variable is, a, is an array and this array contains elements of the type cell and the cell type is a variant type declaration so a cell can either be dead or it can be alive so this might look pretty compli um, complicated it's a function derived from the base library as you can see I use this dot notation array is the thing I imported from uh, up here so it's actually something Definity provides us it's the yeah array functionality and I call the function tabulate and the type I want to tabulate my array with is cell so what I have to do then is to at first declare the length of my array and the length of the array is the width um, multiplied with the height so this is exactly this times this which leads to all those elements so for example if this is 10 and this is 10 we end up with 100 so we store 100 elements inside our array which makes sense because we store all our cells inside the array and we have 100 cells if this is 10 and this is 10 so next i have to provide the tabulate function with another function which itself operates on the index of the array so i provide this function with the index and the index is of course 
a natural number, it starts with zero and yeah, ends by the length of the array minus one. And this is already predefined, so tabulate or the when I provide tabulate with this function, tabulate feeds the function with um, the array in, in indices, indices. So it at first calls the function with zero and stores the outcome at the index zero. Then it calls the function with one and stores the outcome at the index one. Then it calls the function with two and stores the outcome at the index of the array. Uh, the index two of the array. So, yeah, this might be unfamiliar to to you. It was to me at first because I never used the functional programming language, but it's actually quite handy. And once you understand it, it's not that complicated to to use. So, this function here actually defines how I populate my my universe. So this function decides whether a cell at a certain index is dead or if it's alive. And what we do here is we take the index modulo 2 and check if it's 0 or we take the index modulo 7 and check if it's 0. So if one of those two cases is true our cell is going to be alive. And to double check we could uh, head over to um, our front end and check if this is actually true. So what does this actually mean? It means if I divide my index by 2 and there is no um, rest, then my cell should be alive. Or if I divide my index by 7 and there is no rest, then my um, my cell at the index should become alive. So those are multiples of 2 and multiples of 7 that are going to be alive. And as you can see 0 divided by 2 has no um, rest so in this case this statement becomes true and my cell becomes alive which is the case and then the same goes for 2 because 2 divided by 2 or 2 modulo 2 is 0, which is the same as 2 divided by 2 is 0. Oh, did that make sense? Yeah, but if I divide the index 2 by 2, I don't have any rest, which leads to this statement becoming true, because if I calculate the modulo of the number and the rest is 2, it's actually a uh, um, multiply of this number. So 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 and so on. And the same thing for mul multiplies of 7. So this should be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Let's see, we have this one. And then the next one um, is on the same spot as one of the um, well, use modulo 2 because it's 14 and um, yeah, 14 modulo 7 is 0 and 14 modulo 2 is 0 because uh, 2 times 7 is 0 and yeah, other way around. Probably got it already. Yeah, so this is the way we initially populate this universe and of course you can define your own function. You could completely come up with another way to populate this or you could just change the uh, modulo values here you can make this a 4 and this a, I don't know 11 or something like this and yeah of course all other cells which do not apply to this up here will end up dead so alive cells in this case are black and dead cells in this case are white so let's continue with the next function which is the render function. The render function is a asynchronous query function. Uh, query functions usually don't take that long to execute in comparison to um, pure asynchronous functions. The reason for that is because uh, a query function 
as the name already implies, actually just queries a canister and it doesn't alter the canister state. So, for example, in this case, only the internal state of the function is modified. For example, we create two new variables, but we don't really alter anything in the universe of the um, and the cells of the universe or something like that. So yeah, this is just a query function. And as the name already implies, this function is used to render our universe. And we actually do this by transforming the um, um, array that, con that contains the cells into a string. So this is m maybe a little bit weird, but uh, for me it was the easiest way to get the uh, data out of the canister and into a website. So what you actually see here is just a string, a string that contains those uh, UTF-8 characters. They are available there, it's like a black square and a white square or a, yeah. And um, yeah, if I would inspect this, um, I think it's this one. Yeah, you can see that it's literally just a string with line breaks. So how do we do this? Um, at first we declare our variable output, which in the beginning only contains a, a line break. And then also we declare a variable for the current row, which is a natural number initialized with zero. And what we do then is that we iterate through each index of our array. So remember, this is something we imported from the base library and this supplies us with the range function and the range function takes two values, um, in this case the beginning and the end of our iterable and it has the same functionality as the range function in um, Python, except that it's actually giving us um, the last value to. So, for example, if this would be from 0 to 10 and I would print every index, then I would actually lead up with the 10th index too. So, this is why I am subtracting 1 from the length of my cells array. So, this is my universe object. This is my cells array and here I'm accessing the length of the array and then I subtract 1 and this actually gives me the um, indis indices from my array. And I denote those indi indices with index, so this one here. And what we do then is we check if um, get row from our index, so get row actually is a function I declare somewhere down here. Yeah, and this actually gives me back the row of a cell in the grid. So I supply an index. Remember that we flattened the matrix into an index. So I supply an index to the function, and the function returns the um, row where this index is actually positioned in the universe. So if we head back here, for example, as we know, um, one row contains 30 cells. So this is index 0 to index 29, and this index would be index 30. So I provide the function with any index, for example, this one, index 30, and it returns the row number. So because we start counting from zero. This is the zero row. This is the uh, this is the row number zero. This is the row number one. So if I provide the function with uh, thirty, it should return um, the row one, which we can double check. What does it actually do? It takes the index and divides it by the width of the universe, 
So our index is 30 and um, the width of the universe is 32 and if I divide 30 by 30 of course the um, result of this is 1 so for this example it would be correct and does the same thing here for example for where you like 5 it would try to divide 5 by 30 which is not possible so it would return 0. So this operator here defines integer division which basically means if you for example would try to divide 7 by 2 it would uh, lead to 3 and not to 3.5 and this is what we use to determine the row of a given index. So let's head back up. Where have we been? Uh, here exactly. So we initialized our current row with zero which makes sense because we started the first row and because we begin counting by, uh, at zero it is the row number zero. So then we check if the row from our current index is bigger than our currently uh, saved row and if this is the case we concatenate um, a um, line, a new line uh, to our string which basically marks the end of um, one of our rows. So it basically means when I displayed every cell of a row I add a line break or a new line and then I increment my current row counter. So what this does is if I for example hit this character or this uh, index which is index number 30 and um, I would end up with a row index uh, in this case 1 which is bigger than the current row which should be 0 because I initialized it with 0 and then I concatenate a new line character to my string so we have a new line here and uh, uh, next cell will begin a new line. This is how I manage the um, new lines so that my string isn't just uh, 30 times 30 characters in a row. Um, back to the code. Next thing we test is if the um, cell we are currently looking at is dead or alive. How do we do this? We declare a switch statement with two cases and the switch statement takes the universe.cells index so we look at the cell in our cells array at the index which we derive from up here and we check if it's dead or if it's alive so two basic cases as we remember our uh, cell type is either dead or alive and if it is dead we will append a um, empty square to our string and if it's alive we will append a black square to our string and then after we iterated through all indices we will then return the output which is a string and this string looks exactly like this. So let's head over to the next function. This function is also a query function and it just gets our universe and pretty straightforward returns the, the cells of our, of, our, of our universe. All right, let's continue with the tick function. The tick function is again an asynchronous function, but it's not a query function because this one actually alters the state of our canister because in here um, we are calculating the new state after a tick of our universe. So we calculate a new generation. And in order to do so, in order to um, operate on the old state and calculate a new state, 
we save the current state of the universe inside this variable or at least we save the cells from the uh, from the current generation inside this array and you already know the tabulate function nothing new here we just um, yeah copy the array over here so what we do here is that we create universe after the tick and tabulate again takes the length of the array and this one is a generator function and this time it's a little bit more complicated as you know um, we automatically feed the function we declare here with uh, all indices between 0 and this integer minus 1 so what do we do first? At first we derive the row from our current index and the column from our current index um, the row and column functions are down here I don't know if I already talked about this but yeah pretty simple integer division and here modulo operation to actually get the row and the column for a given index and next thing we are going to do is that we will um, calculate our live neighbors so for the index we are currently looking at so for the cell we are currently looking at we, we are interested in how many neighboring cells are alive because as you know the, the rules of game of life um, or the, the, the decision if a cell becomes alive or dead in the next generation depends on its surrounding neighbors so we have to retrieve the information for a given cell so we have to retrieve how many neighbors are alive for a given index so in this case for a given cell in our array and to do this I implemented a live neighbor count function which takes a row a column and the array that represents our old in yeah in parentheses our old universe cells so let's head down and check what this actually does so the implementation is here again this counts our life or our alive neighbors and returns the number of them and at first we have to decide what north should be and south should be and west should be and east should be for a given row and uh, for a given column the thing is you can imagine our universe as a snake grid so as you know in snake you can maneuver through the boundaries of the grid and if you actually end up here you begin to reappear down, reappear down there and the same thing goes um, for traveling from from right to left so if you had to if you hit the border of this grid you will just um, yeah end up on the other side it's like a yeah like a snake grid so if we imagine we if we imagine we, we are looking at this cell and we want to derive the um, row southern of the cell we just subtract one from the current row but if if we want to derive the northern row from the current row we would add uh, no other way around so imagine we are looking at this cell and we want to check which column is northern of this cell what would we do we would probably just subtract one but in this case we are already at the lowest possible column because this is column 0 and if we subtract 0 from this column we would end up with minus 1 which isn't even a valid um, natural number so what we do instead is we check if we are currently in the first row and if so we decide that the row northern from this row especially this row will be the last row and this is exactly what happens here we check hey is the current row we are looking at the row 0 and if so the row northern from the cell we are currently looking at will be 
the universe height minus one, which in this case, if we initialize our universe with 30 rows and 30 uh, columns, would be 29. And in, in all other cases, we just calculate the provided row minus one. Same thing for south, west, and east. So to give you a graphical representation of our situation, this is the cell we are looking at. We can perfectly derive the cell by the given column and given row. For example, if I give you this column, uh, this yeah, this column, and this row, we would end up exactly with I think it's this one with this cell, and we would look at the row above, the row underneath, the row and uh, yeah, row above, row underneath, column to the right and column to the left. So north, east, south, west. So now that we know those values, we can also think about how to retrieve the status of uh, cells that are northwest from ourselves, uh, ourselves, yeah, ourselves, northeast of ourselves, southeast of ourselves, and southwest from ourselves. So we actually just calculate the index for um, our given rows and columns. So if I provide the get index function with a um, column and a row, you know, with a row and a column, um, I will derive um, or I will get an index. And let's check the implementation. Get index. So you feed in a row and a column, and the function returns the corresponding index. And for example, if we are in row number five and um, column number two, we would calculate the corresponding index by multiplying our row with our universe width and adding our column. So in this case, five. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, no, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times 30 would be 150 plus, for example, 7 would be 157 and this would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this cell here has index 157. So uh, let's get back into the formal function. So now we have the, the index for our northwestern cell, which is this one, because we take the northern row and the western column. It is clear that we end up with the index from northwest. And to actually get the uh, status of the cell, to actually check if it's dead or alive, we again provide our old universe because if we would be working on our um, current universe, or if the if we if we if we would be working on the universe dot cells, like if the if we would be working on the actual cell array of our universe, it could be that we, for example, because we we start with index zero and um, finish with our last index could be that I like this would be the old state and um, when I calculated the state for this cell I decided that it doesn't stay dead anymore it becomes live and then I continue 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 and then I want to calculate the state for um, this uh, index or for this particular cell and because I already changed the state of the cell above I would probably or it, it could be possible that I would also change the outcome of this cell so what I do is I work on a copy of the whole universe where I don't alter anything I just keep this old copy with me and I use it to check whether cells have been previously dead or alive and every time I have a new decision for the next generation I um, insert this new cell into my universe.cell um, 
array. So I have two different arrays I work on. Yeah, where one where I actually save the next generation and the other one which just contains a snapshot of the old generation to derive the status or to calculate the state of the new generation. All right, so what does get count actually do? It's a pretty simple function. It takes an index, takes a, the old universe cells array, returns a number. The number it returns is actually the amount of or the, um, the status of the cell. If the cell is dead, it will return zero. And if the status is uh, alive, it will return one. And all of this is implemented in the switch case where I look at the index of the array and in case the uh, element at the given position is alive, I count plus one, and in case it's dead, I count plus zero, and then I return the count. Pretty straightforward. And all of these counts add up into the count variable, which I declared here. We start with zero, and then we add up all the status statuses of our neighboring cells. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cells we look at and best case is, or what, not bad ca best case, but one case could be that all cells would be alive, in this case our count would be 8, and another extreme case could be that all cells are dead, and in this case our count would be 0. So we do this for all the remaining cells, and this is then actually the total count of our alive neighbor cells from the cell we are currently looking at. So for example, if I would be looking at this particular cell, I could easily see, no, not this one, oh, okay, let's just take this one. If I look at this particular cell, I could easily see that two neighboring cells are alive, and in this case, for this index, I would return a two, and according to the amount of alive cells, I would then update this particular cell in the uh, next, or for the next generation. So, we have this count now, and this count is then being used to decide what actually happens with the cell we are currently looking at. So, down here are basically the uh, rules we looked at at the beginning, written in Motoko, and here we decide whether a cell will be dead or alive after our tick. So, what are the rules again? We have four cases. This is a switch statement, and the outcome of the switch statement will be assigned to this variable, which is called new state, which makes sense because we want to derive the new state of the current um, index or the current cell we look at. So what do we do? We provide um, our old universe snapshot and look at the index we are currently looking at. And we also have the live neighbor, uh, the live neighbors, the count of the live neighbors, how many um, cells are actually alive. So what do we do? This has two cases, either the cell we are currently looking at is dead or the cell we are looking are currently looking at is alive. And this has, let me, nine possible outcomes um, between yeah, zero and eight. And what do we actually do next? We check our cases. If um, the cell we are currently looking at is alive, and we have two live neighbors, or if the cell we are currently looking at is alive and we have three live neighbors, nothing changes. The cell stays alive. If we compare this to our um, game uh, of life rules, we can then see here that this is actually rule number two. Any live cell with two or three live neighbors lives on to the next generation. So back to the code, next case. In case um, our cell, the cell we are currently looking at is alive and um, it is none of the above case uh, above cases, so it's not it have it does not have two or three neighboring cells, our cell will die. This is the same as rule number one and rule number three combined, because any live cell with fewer than two live neighbors dies, as if by underpopulation. This is, um, yeah, this is taken care of by this case, and any live cell with more than three live neighbors dies, as if by overpopulation, is also taken care of by this 
uh, case. So the x in here just acts like a variable. It could be any value other than two or three. And important here is the alignment of the cases so that we start with this case and continue with that case. Um, because, for example, um, if I would implement it the other way around, um, it wouldn't be. I can actually just try this. Should be throwing an error. Let me try and build this. Yeah, then the compiler gives me a warning that the case in line number 96 will never be reached because this x is um, for all values that possibly that uh, live neighbors could possibly take. Uh, this case is just unnecessary and will never be reached because it will always, if a cell is alive, it will always trigger this case and the cell will always be dead. So it's important that we um, keep the right order in here. All right, so let's head over to the um, next case, which is um, the case that we are looking at the cell which is already dead. And only in the case that a dead cell has three live neighbors, the cell becomes alive, which represents represents rule number four. Any dead cell with exactly three live neighbors becomes a live cell as if by rep reproduction. And then we also say in all other cases, so no matter what um, the state of my cell is and no matter how many live neighbors we counted, the state of the cell would just be the same. And that's it. This way we have our new state which represents the new state for the cell we are currently looking at and this function then emits this last new state and the new state will be written into our universe uh, in the in this in this cells array of our universe at the correct corresponding index so it would be if we would be looking at index number 5 then the value of new state would be written in our universe.cells array on index number 5. All right, long explanation. I hope it made a little bit sense. <laughs> Let's continue with the start function. The start function is an asynchronous function too. And notice that here the only function that is exposed to the outside is the start function. It's like a trigger function to call. And all other functions that the start function invokes are synchronous. This way, the calculation of them is way quicker. And also, the notable difference here is that we print the output of the state of our universe to the command line instead of displaying it on a website. So this function uh, was implement implemented for debugging. So, like I said, we do the same thing. We save the old universe into a or the state of the old universe into a variable. Then we go into a while true loop, which we label draw loop. We save the um, new state of the universe, uh, which is retrieved from the sync tick function, which stands for synchronous tick function. It is exactly the same function that we just talked about, with the notable difference that it, this is not an asynchronous function. This also returns the state of the new universe, in this case an array of cells. And what we do inside this if statement is we check if the old universe actually is the same as the new universe. If this is the case, we know that the state will never change and we can break out of the draw loop. That, that is the, the, um, yeah, the base case, so the while true loop doesn't run forever. Yeah, well, it might be running forever, but if we run into a state where the universe cannot possibly change anymore, we can break out of the loop. And this is um, reached by using an array equals function, also provided by the base library. And we put in our old universe cells, which we saved up here, with the state of the new universe, which we have up here. And then we have to provide a 
a function that tests for equality. It's a pretty simple function, um, which is down here. It takes two cells, cell A and cell B, and it returns a boolean. And here we um, declare or define a switch statement again. And the cases are pretty straightforward. If both cells are dead, they are equal, so it returns true. If both stats, uh, cells are alive, they are equal, and the function returns true. And in all other cases, um, it returns false. So let's head back up um, to our start function. Yeah, and if this is the case, we break out of the loop. And if this is not the case, we assign the just newly created generation to the old universe cells and we just repeat the process. And the last thing we do is we draw and draw as a function that actually puts the universe um, into our command line, into our terminal. And what does this do? It has a variable called output which contains text. We begin with a line break and then we go through each row of the universe. You know the functionality of this already, so I won't cover it again. And then it and creates a new variable called temp, temporary, which holds text and begins with this vertical line. And then we go through each column um, of our universe. And we say, um, we, uh, we, we define a new variable, which, which is the index variable, so we get the index from uh, our column and row. So basically what this does is, here's an output of it. Um, as you saw, this is the predefined first character of the string, and then we go through each row, column by column, and depending on the state of the cell we are currently looking at. If it's dead, we add this little um, car to our string, and if it's alive, we add this little car to our string. And after we iterated through each column, we then iterate um, through the other rows and then for each column inside the rows. And in the end, for each um, row, we again add a vertical line and a new line and the last thing we print out is this horizontal line so the output looks like this. I could actually delete this because it doesn't really change anything in terms of visibility but yeah this is what it looks like and um, we get this functionality by populating our universe and then if we click the start button um, we actually call the um, start function. So what does this actually look like? We populate our universe and if we click the start button this actually invokes the start function and then the output instead of being displayed on the website will be displayed in our terminal terminal and as you will see it is way faster in executing. So let's try this. I will head down here and we hit start and as you can see it was in a not even a second to calculate the different states and if I would double check this now, it's exactly the same output as we would get when we would render it inside our website. So I could scroll down here, I don't know if I'm fast enough. Yep, and then it ends. And if we take bigger universe, maybe 20, you will then again see that it is way faster down here, and here we all actually have this alternating thing which is cool to see in a fast way and at some point we will run out of gas. Yeah.